A verse-by-verse -verse study in the book of Ephesians, ESV, with Irv Rish, chapter 6. What does Ephesians chapter 6 mean? Chapter 6 offer four primary points closing out Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. First, he provides instruction regarding children and parents, Ephesians 6 verses 1 to 4. Second, he provides instructions for the relationship between masters and servants, Ephesians 6 verses 5 to 9. Third, Paul discusses the armor of God, Ephesians 6 verses 10 to 20. Fourth, Paul concludes with final greetings to his readers, Ephesians 6 verses 21 to 24. The first section, Ephesians 6 verses 1 to 4, teaches children to obey their parents. This instruction is based on one of the Ten Commandments, Ephesians 6 verses 2 to 3. Fathers are not to provoke their children to anger. Instead, they are to raise them according to God's discipline and instruction, Ephesians 6 verse 4. The second section addresses servants and masters, Ephesians 6 verses 5 to 9. Servants are to obey their masters with a sincere heart as if serving the Lord, Ephesians 6 verses 5 to 7. Whatever good they do will be received back, Ephesians 6 verse 8. Masters are to treat their servants in the same way and not threaten them. Masters are to recognize they and their servants have a common master in heaven that judges fairly, Ephesians 6 verse 9. The third part, Ephesians 6 verses 10 to 20, discusses the armor of God. Believers are to be strong in the Lord, Ephesians 6 verse 10, and put on the whole armor of God, Ephesians 6 verse 11, to stand against Satan's schemes. Our battle is spiritual, not physical, Ephesians 6 verse 12. This armor allows believers to stand firm in the faith, Ephesians 6 verse 13. It includes the belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness, shoes with readiness, the shield of faith, and the helmet of salvation, Ephesians 6 verses 14-17. The Word of God is listed as the one offensive weapon, used both to protect and to strike back against evil, Ephesians 6 verse 17. Believers are to pray at all times, keep alert, and persevere, Ephesians 6 verse 18. Paul also asked his readers to pray for him to speak boldly about Christ, Ephesians 6 verses 19 to 20. The final part of this letter, Ephesians 6 verses 21 to 24, mentions a few final greetings to his readers. Paul says he is sending Tychicus to tell them more about his situation, Ephesians 6 verse 21. His goal was to encourage them during his visit with this letter, Ephesians 6 verse 22. Paul ends by offering peace, love, and faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, Ephesians 6 verse 23. He ends with his distinctive mention of giving grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible, Ephesians 6 verse 24. This love that cannot be corrupted is a true, genuine love that Paul experienced in his time with the Ephesian believers that could not be stopped. It had already spread throughout the entire region and would continue to change lives long after Paul's letter. Chapter Context Ephesians opens with three chapters of doctrine, followed by three chapters of practical application. This final chapter of Paul's letter focuses on specific ways Christians should live. It also summarizes the spiritual tools we are given by God, imagining them as a suit of armor. Paul pulls the same basic ideas from the rest of letter together, showing how Christians should live out their knowledge of what salvation in Christ really means. Verse by verse. Verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Verses 1 through 3 offer a brief set of instructions for children. This verse offers a summary clearly written to children still living under the authority of their parents. The emphasis here is on godly obedience. This is not blind or mindless cooperation, Acts 5 verse 39. Rather, this is submission grounded in a love for God. For children to obey their parents is specifically referred to as, right. God often presents clear moral instructions in Scripture. Children obeying parents is one of these non-negotiable mandates. It should not be unusual to expect children to follow the instruction of their parents. 
Not only are the parents responsible for bringing the child into the world, they have a much better view of what is best for the child. Even when a parent's instructions are hard to understand, children do well to trust and obey. In this way, the parent-child dynamic is meant to be a powerful allegory for the relationship between each of us and God. Here, Paul's command is given under the expectation that parents love and protect their children, and that children obey them until they are old enough to live independently. Context Summary Ephesians 6 verses 1-4 gives instructions for children to obey their parents, and for parents to be careful in how they raise their children. Children who learn respect for proper authority will have a better chance at success in life. And, obedience to parents is the morally right way to behave. Parents, however, are to be careful not to antagonize their children. Instead of pushing them towards anger or frustration, Christian parents should give their children loving, God-centered teaching and discipline. Verse 2. Honor your father and mother, this is the first commandment with a promise. Paul again refers to the Torah, which is the first five books of the Old Testament. The commandment is originally found in Exodus 20 verse 12, which states, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Paul notes that, of the Ten Commandments, this instruction is the first which comes with an explicit consequence. The promise is that of a blessed, long life. Specifically, this is a promise to Israel. But, in a generic sense, this is a common-sense truth which applies to everyone. Children who grow into disrespect and disobedience towards their parents usually have a much harder life. Learning to respect legitimate authority is key to personal success. At the same time, Paul's instructions here will point out that parents have a responsibility to encourage obedience in their children, rather than frustrate them. Verse 4 will remind fathers that they need to raise their children with discipline and instruction, but should be careful not to frustrate them by being petty or unfair. Verse 3. That it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Paul continues his reference to Exodus 20 verse 12 here. Honoring one's parents included promises in two areas. For the Israelites, this commandment claimed obedience would cause it to go well with them. This is a general blessing rather than a specific one. The idea is that honoring parents is something God both commands and rewards. This blessing was originally given to Israel, yet the application of blessing upon those who honor their parents clearly extends to believers today, according to Paul's teaching in verses 1 through 3. Second, the Israelites were promised that they would live long in the land. This particular promise is specific to Jews living under the Mosaic Law. Christians have no land in the way the Jews did when the Ten Commandments were written. Instead, the Christian's obedience leads to heavenly rewards in a kingdom not of this world. In a more general sense, it's easy to see how learning respect for legitimate authority, as opposed to learning rebellion, has a profound impact on a child's chances in life. Verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. After three verses dedicated to how children should obey parents, one verse is given specifically for fathers. As the head of the household, the father is charged with ultimate responsibility for the way the children are raised. In practice, this instruction is meant for both parents, and would have been understood that way by Paul's readers. Fathers are commanded not to agitate or irritate their children. The Greek word is parorgesite, which implies exasperation or frustration. In practice, this means avoiding unfair and cruel behavior, or blatant favoritism. Godly fathers are not to push their children toward anger. Anger can sometimes be a healthy emotion, yet can often lead to sin, Ephesians 4 verse 26. Instead, fathers, parents, are given a positive command to bring them up. In other words, Christians are expected to be highly involved in raising their own children. Two areas are mentioned. First, Paul includes discipline. 
Discipline involved learning self-control and the ability to restrain from personal desires in order to do what is right. Second, Paul adds the instruction of the Lord. We should be involved in teaching our children about God's ways through both education and example. According to Scripture, a father trains the child he loves, Proverbs 3 verse 12, instructs him, Proverbs 13 verse 1, and provides for his children, Proverbs 19 verse 14. Verse 5. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Verses 5 through 9 provide Paul's instructions for servants and masters. In this verse, Paul notes the importance of obedience to one's master, three specific aspects are noted. First, Paul mentions, fear and trembling. The terms do not imply terror or living in dread. Rather, this carries the idea of respect and reverence. Second, Paul adds that service should be done with, a sincere heart. A servant should not attempt to deceive a master, but rather genuinely work hard to do his or her best. Third, Paul sets the highest standard possible in stating that a servant's obedience should be as serving Christ. This would have been a difficult challenge, especially for servants under the rule of harsh masters. Though servants in Ephesus lived with relatively pleasant conditions, compared to the African slavery experienced in America, not all did. Even in the worst situations, Paul wanted servants to show the love of Christ. Paul often sought freedom for slaves, Philemon 1 verses 15-16, yet also encouraged those in bondage to still live for Christ. Paul will specifically address those who command servants, or who own slaves, in verse 9. There, he will remind them that they are no better than those they oversee, and God will not show favoritism. Context Summary Ephesians 6 verses 5 to 9 give specific instructions for both servants and masters. Servants should give a good effort, more than just for show, in all things they are required to do. This shows respect for their master, but it also provides a good example of one's relationship to Christ. At the same time, masters are explicitly told not to be abusive to their underlings. God sees masters as no better than those they command and He is the ultimate master of both. Verse 6. Not by the way of eye service, as people-pleasers, but as bondservants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Paul addresses the problem of doing things only for the sake of gaining others' approval. He calls it literally, the way of eye service, or the problem of only working hard when the master's eyes are directly on us. Paul also notes this type of behavior as being a people-pleaser. Some serve, but do so for wrong motives. This might be to feel good about themselves, or to impress someone else, as in this context. This might also include those who seek to do as little as possible, while putting on a show, to make an overseer think they are doing more than they really are. Paul condemns all of these practices, calling bondservants instead bondservants of Christ. A bondservant of Christ, or servant of the Lord, such as Elijah or John the Baptist, would not serve only when seen by others but at all times and for the glory of God. As Paul words it, God's servants are to serve doing the will of God from the heart. It is not the service that is wrong, but the attitude that is wrong, when a servant does work only for others to notice, but not for God's glory. Verse 7 rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. Paul adds additional traits for the servant in this verse and the next. Here, the emphasis is on a person's attitude. The Christian servant must work with a godly attitude regardless of circumstances. Paul set a tremendous example in this area. Though imprisoned, he wrote encouraging letters to believers and shared the gospel while under house arrest. He did not let his bondage keep him from living with a godly attitude and instructed others to do the same. A godly attitude is much easier when a servant views his or her work as, to the Lord. We are to do all things for the glory of God, Colossians 3 verse 17. With this perspective, 
we can respond with an attitude in life that honors God and shows love to others in the most difficult contexts. This is even easier when the one we are serving also takes a godly approach, something Paul will refer to in verse 9. However, regardless of whether our boss is doing right, we as Christians are called to be good examples. Verse 8. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. In this verse, Paul extends the principle he has just given for servants to all believers. Whenever a Christian serves with good actions, from a good heart, he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Those who bless others will be blessed by the Lord. This is sometimes confused with the idea of karma, though it is not the same thing. Karma is a belief in Eastern religions that everything one does will be done back to them. More specifically, that a person's actions create a balance of good and evil which they must account for in their next reincarnation. This is not what Paul means. Instead, those who serve others are rewarded by the Lord. He may bless believers both in this life and the next for good deeds, though many rewards will only be known in heaven. This verse also clarifies that the principle applies to any kind of worker, slave or otherwise. Many today enjoy employment which is voluntary. Yet, the principle of doing good for others, in the context of one's work, and for the glory of God, is still important. Godly work habits honor the Lord, show a positive example to others, provide a better work environment, and open opportunities to share Christ with unbelievers. Verse 9. Masters, do the same to them, and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. Verse 5 through 8 focused on the spiritual obligations of servants. In this verse, the masters of these servants are specifically addressed. Interestingly, they are given the exact same charge. Namely, they are supposed to be doing the will of God, for the good of others, from a pure and willing heart, Ephesians 6 verse 6. Masters may be in charge, but they are also to lead others according to God's ways. In addition, Paul commanded, Stop your threatening. In a culture where masters and slave owners were given freedom to abuse their servants, Paul taught directly against this practice. His reason is based on their common lord. This is a powerful incentive for the master, or slave owner to be careful how they treat those over whom they have power. Masters were, and are, accountable to God for their actions toward those they lead. While Paul elsewhere appeals for slaves to be freed, Philemon 1 verses 15-16, the basic idea applies regardless of culture or laws. Paul then reminds masters that there is no partiality with God. He will not show favor to those with more money or influence. God judges perfectly and righteously, reminding masters that godly actions are required of them regardless of their earthly status. Abuse of another, in the eyes of God, is not excused by a master-slave relationship, nor by an employer-employee relationship. This fits cleanly with Paul's similar teaching on the mutual responsibilities of husbands and wives, Ephesians 5 verses 22-33, and children and parents, Ephesians 6 verses 1-4. Verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Verses 10-20 through 20 are a famous and well-used portion of Scripture. Paul wraps up his practical teachings with a series of analogies, comparing aspects of the Christian faith to the equipment carried by a soldier. This verse introduces the overall motivation for Paul's instructions. Namely, this is strength, through the Lord, and of the Lord. Paul opened his letter with a prayer for the Ephesian Christians to receive wisdom and knowledge, Ephesians 1 verses 15-23. Here, after discussing the real-world application of that wisdom, Paul notes that the believer does not rely on his or her own strength, but on the power of God to win victory in life's battles. The following verses will offer an outline of each part of the metaphorical armor of God. Each piece connects to an area of spiritual life important for reliance upon God's strength. Paul's depiction of these components will conclude with a focus on prayer, 
Ephesians 6 verses 18-20, again asking God for strength and success in battle. Only by relying on God, through these spiritual tools, can we overcome spiritual evil and succeed at living out God's will. Paul personally saw himself as a spiritual warrior as well. In fact, he was often a prisoner of war, in a sense, Ephesians 6 verse 20, yet still involved in the battle to reach others with the good news of Jesus. Context Summary Ephesians 6 verses 10-20 concludes Paul's practical application of Christianity with a famous series of metaphors. Here, he describes the armor of God. In this passage, Paul uses the allegory of a Roman soldier's basic equipment to show how the components of Christianity work together as we strive to serve God. The soldier's tools include a belt, breastplate, shoes, shield, helmet, and sword. In parallel, the Christian's implements are truth, righteousness, the gospel, faith, salvation, and the word of God. Christians are also given prayer. Just as a soldier's equipment is designed for their earthly battle, a Christian's equipment is meant for spiritual warfare. Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Here Paul introduces the armor of God, a famous and often used metaphor from the Bible. Paul begins with two important qualifiers in this verse. These give a useful perspective on how these various components are meant to function, and why they are important. His admonition to put on these pieces is also instructive, Christians have to be deliberate about using these implements. First, believers must plan to utilize all tools available to them. One or two pieces are not sufficient, especially in light of the second qualification, which are the plans of Satan. Only with every piece of the armor of God can a believer adequately stand against the schemes of the devil. Just as a Roman soldier could not reasonably enter battle with a partial suit of armor, or with only some of his weapons, a believer will not be as successful in spiritual battle unless every part of God's armor is included. Second, Paul calls the devil's work against believers, schemes. This indicates a coordinated plan of attack against believers. It is clear Paul does not have in mind physical violence, but rather a spiritual battle, Ephesians 6 verse 12. Further, the devil appears to specifically seek to destroy the good work of all believers. Thankfully, his power is no match for the power available through God. However, believers must pray and fully rely on God's resources to stand firm, Ephesians 6 verse 13, against his attacks. Using the armor of God fully is key to surviving this spiritual onslaught. Also interesting is the fact that these tools are meant to allow Christians to stand against the devil. The verse does not suggest conquering, leading a charge, or other types of offense. While believers are called to speak out against evil, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5, triumph over Satan primarily involves holding a firm defense and allowing Christ to win the ultimate victory. Verse 12 will put this battle in graphic terms. At the same time, Paul will make it clear that Christians are engaged in a spiritual war, not an earthly one. Verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. This famous verse describes the spiritual battle that exists in the lives of believers. It does so perhaps better than any other words in Scripture. First, Paul affirms our battle is indeed spiritual, not physical. The enemies we face, ultimately, are not people or objects. The devil may use those as part of his attack, but our true opponent is not other people, it is sin. Second, Paul identifies our spiritual enemies. This list is commonly interpreted as a vague listing of the ranks within the demonic armies. Rulers seem to indicate a top level of evil spiritual forces. Authorities refer to general forces of evil attacking believers. Cosmic powers seems to refer to the worldwide nature of this spiritual battle. Evil in the heavenly places again emphasizes a battle beyond this world. 
spiritual battles can occur at all levels, anywhere across this world and beyond. The believer must be prepared for all types of attacks through putting on God's armor, as Paul describes. Verse 13. Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Because of the wide scope and power of spiritual evil faced by believers, Ephesians 6 verse 12, Paul reminds Christians that all of these tools are critically important. God's armor is a package, not a cafeteria of items from which we can select. We must have salvation in God's Word. We need prayer and righteousness, not one or the other. All of these areas must work together to operate effectively. Paul often groups interconnected spiritual ideas together to emphasize their importance. An example is his reference to the fruit of the Spirit, which mentions nine total attributes, Galatians 5 verses 22-23. This is a literary technique, meant to imply that all listed areas are essential for the believer. This avoids the misinterpretation of picking and choosing which instructions a person wishes to pursue, while neglecting others. Those who put on the full armor of God are promised certain benefits. The evil day can refer to any moment of spiritual attack. It does not refer to a future, last days, scenario. Believers are to constantly be on guard, living prepared with God's armor. Also, believers who wear God's armor can stand firm, a phrase used in connection with success with God in the Old Testament, Exodus 14 verse 13. 2 Chronicles 20 verse 17, Psalm 89 verse 28, Isaiah 46 verse 8, Daniel 11 verse 32. As with verse 11, the phrases used in this verse strongly imply defense over offense. This is not to say that Christians are never called on to actively engage falsehoods, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5. Rather, it is a reminder that in our spiritual battle, God will win the victory. We are not called on to charge against Satan, but to endure his attacks until Christ wins the ultimate triumph. Verse 14. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. The first two parts of God's armor are noted in this verse. Paul describes these parts of a Roman soldier's clothing in the order they would have been put on. First, Paul mentions the belt of truth. In that time, a belt was tied around the waist rather than buckled. It was therefore, fastened, as Paul notes. These were not thin, pretty strips of cloth, either. A soldier's belt was thick and sturdy, somewhat like what modern people would call a weightlifter's belt. The rest of a soldier's armor connected to this belt. For the Christian, truth is to be securely connected to us, for our success. Truth as Paul defined it, included the accurate information regarding God and the good news of Jesus, Ephesians 1 verse 13, 4 15, 21, 25. From a logical standpoint, this is also a sensible statement. Truth binds together everything else we believe. Without unifying truth, we just have disjointed, disconnected pieces. Second is the breastplate of righteousness. This belt would hold the breastplate in place, as well as the scabbard to hold the sword, Ephesians 6 verse 17. A Roman's breastplate would typically be made from bronze or chain mail and would cover the vital body parts, heart, lungs, stomach. Righteousness, or doing what is right, is essential to protecting the life of the believer through spiritual battle. Also, the breastplate is a primary means of identification. This is one of the clearer ways for soldiers to recognize each other in battle. Likewise, a Christian's behavior is meant to identify them to the world, and other believers, as a follower of Christ. Verse 15. And, as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Roman soldiers typically wore sandals which allowed them to move quickly during battle, and provided protection to their feet. Here Paul imagines the shoes as the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Shoes made a soldier ready to run into battle. The gospel of peace likewise makes a believer ready for spiritual battle. 
Anyone who has walked around outside with no shoes knows that some areas are virtually off-limits when you're barefoot. Shoes give you the ability to go almost anywhere. Shoes also provide traction. The gospel anchors our faith in certain basic, universal truths. Without that, we'd find our foundation slipping. One of the modern world's most common problems is stress. Yet the peace given through the gospel is the answer to most of our daily anxiety. We can cast our cares on God because He cares for us, 1 Peter 5 verse 7. Further, connecting the concept of shoes with the gospel of peace may also suggest the idea of believers taking the gospel into daily battles, sharing it wherever they go, Matthew 28 verses 18-20. Believers are given the gospel of peace in order to be ready for battle and to help others facing spiritual attack. Those who study martial arts know that setting one's feet is the beginning of all combat. They affect balance, grip, power, and movement. In the same way, the foundation of our day-to-day -day Christianity is the gospel. Verse 16. In all circumstances take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. One of an ancient soldier's most important tools was a shield. It was essential to protect against enemy attacks, whether swords, arrows, stones, spears, or other attacks. This was such a powerful implement that shields are often associated with strength in the Old Testament. God calls himself a shield to Abraham, Genesis 15 verse 1, and served as a shield to Israel, Deuteronomy 33 verse 29. Used in formations, cooperating with other soldiers, shields were the defining equipment in many battles. Faith, in this case, is what deflects the attacks of the enemy. The other parts of the armor will protect the soldier if the shield is bypassed. But the strongest defense is the shield, it actually protects the rest of the armor. Note, though, that the analogy of a shield of faith also counters the frequent criticism of religion as blind faith. Shields are purposeful instruments, not walls to hide behind. Shields, by their nature, are meant to be used with strategy, awareness, and cooperation. The beauty of a Roman shield was its ability to resist nearly any type of attack. In this context, Paul notes that the shield of faith can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. The attack he mentions is fiery arrows, a common tactic in ancient war. Even a Roman breastplate could be pierced by an arrow. Shields prone to catch fire were vulnerable. Roman shields were lined with leather, and usually soaked with water before a battle. In other words, the one providing the armor gives his troops equipment perfectly suited to surviving the enemy onslaught. Also notice the attack is from the evil one, Satan. Elsewhere, Jesus teaches to pray for protection against Satan as the evil one, Matthew 6 verse 13. Satan cannot be everywhere at once since he is not God, yet Paul seems to indicate Satan attempts to attack every believer he can. Like a military commander, he can attack Christians indirectly through his demons. Interestingly, the shield is the only defensive piece of armor which can also protect other people. Ancient soldiers would typically fight in formation, interlocking their shields. This meant each man protected both himself and others with his shield. In the community of believers, cooperation, unity, and holiness are crucial. When we work in formation, we form a wall of faith which makes the entire church safer and stronger. Verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Helmets are essential in battle. A helmet can protect against stones, hand weapons, projectiles, fists, impacts with the ground or other attacks aimed at the head. Soldiers knew one hit to the head could mean disaster in battle. For this reason, the helmet does more to put a soldier at ease than almost any other piece of armor. Paul associates the helmet in the armor of God with salvation. Salvation is ultimately the best protection against Satan, since nothing, even Satan, can separate us from the love of God in Christ, Romans 8 verses 37-39.
In addition, Paul mentions, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is the first offensive weapon mentioned. The sword was used to kill and defeat enemies during attack. The typical Roman sword was not a long, cumbersome weapon. Rather, they were short-bladed, easy to draw, and quick in combat. Paul uses the term machiron here, which specifically refers to a short-bladed sword of this type. In the same way, God's Word helps to defeat our enemies during spiritual attacks. During the temptations of Jesus by Satan, Jesus used Scripture on all three occasions to overcome temptation, Matthew 4 verses 1 to 11. Those who study and know Scripture can best strike back against temptation and prevent the devil from knocking them off of their post. It should also be noted that swords, as powerful weapons, are subject to misuse. A properly wielded sword, used as the soldier has been taught, is a capable tool. But, a soldier who swings a sword wildly or carelessly is liable to harm themselves or others. The same is true of the Bible, the sword of the Spirit. Improper, careless, or rebellious use of the Bible causes pain, harm, and spiritual damage. Verse 18. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. After describing the pieces of the armor of God, Paul adds another important part of spiritual battle, prayer. This is not a piece of spiritual armor, yet is essential to winning spiritual battles. Why? Prayer connects us to the power of God, which is necessary to defeat spiritual enemies. Communication in battle is often the difference between victory and defeat. This is especially true when referring to soldiers hearing the instructions of their commander. Paul then notes some specific applications of prayer in this verse and the next. First, believers are to pray, in the Spirit. Our prayers are not merely our thoughts or about our desires, but are to be done in submission to God. Next, we are to, keep alert. While we may not be literally praying every waking second, there is never a good time to set prayer aside. It's a tool we need to have in constant use, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17. Third, prayer is something to do with all perseverance. We do not pray once each day and then stop. We are to talk with God persistently and about all matters. Nothing is too big or too small to discuss with the Lord. Finally, Paul highlights the importance of praying for the needs of other believers. We praise God in prayer, pray for our own needs, and also pray for the needs of others. Each of these areas is important. Verse 19. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. In addition to the areas of prayer mentioned in verse 18, Paul adds a request for personal prayer. As Paul prepares to end his letter, he takes time to request prayer for his life and work in Rome. The first area of prayer he mentions is for boldness. His goal was not personal comfort, but effective ability to evangelize those around him. Notice also that his prayer to share the gospel included a request for the right words to share. We are to share our faith through our actions, yet are also called to share our faith with our words. It has become common to hear the saying, share the gospel always, and when necessary use words. With respect to all, this is somewhat like saying, feed the hungry always, and when necessary use food. Paul shows the importance of actions and words working together. Bold sharing of faith includes the effective use of speaking to communicate the good news of Christ. Without the truths of the words, there is no gospel. Verse 20. For which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly, as I ought to speak. Paul viewed himself not merely as a lowly prisoner, but as, an ambassador in chains. He was a representative of the King of Kings, albeit one in captivity. As a prisoner under house arrest, Paul might have still been literally chained in his apartment. In some cases, prisoners were shackled to a Roman solder, which may have stirred Paul's analogy of the armor of God. 
Others view the reference to chains as a generic metaphor for his imprisonment. Regardless, Paul had already spent previous time in literal chains for the faith and could rightly use this title. Further, Paul noted that declaring God's truth boldly was the right thing to do. He did not view being quiet about his faith as honorable. Instead, he asked for faith to speak even more boldly about Christ. This was quite admirable, given the fact that he was already imprisoned because of his preaching of the gospel. Paul refused to back down, and rather wanted to become even bolder in presenting the good news of Jesus Christ. Verse 21 so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord will tell you everything. This verse begins the concluding section of the letter, extending through 624. Paul expresses a desire to offer additional information about his situation in Rome. In addition to this letter, he seems to be sending a particular person, Tychicus, to the Ephesian church. Tychicus more than likely delivered additional information, along with Paul's written greetings. Tychicus had served with Paul, as mentioned in Acts 20 verse 4. In addition to delivering the letter to the Ephesians, he also delivered a letter to the Colossian believers, during the same trip. There, he was called, a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, while traveling with one Zymus, Colossians 4 verse 7. This strongly suggests that the letter of Philemon was delivered during this same trip, around the year AD 62. Near the end of Paul's life, a few years later, he will mention sending Tychicus to Ephesus, 2 Timothy 4 verse 12, and his plans to send Tychicus to Titus, Titus 3 verse 12. By this, we can conclude that Tychicus was a faithful helper to Paul in the final years of his life. Context Summary Ephesians 6 verses 21-24 completes Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. He has just described our tools of spiritual warfare, using the analogy of a soldier's armor. He has also reminded Christians of the importance of prayer in our moment-by-moment -moment discipleship with Christ. In these closing verses, Paul will explain his plans to send Tychicus, one of his long-serving assistants, to deliver both this letter and additional news. Verse 22. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. This verse clearly expresses the reasons Paul sent Tychicus to Ephesus with this letter, I have sent him to you for this very purpose. Two reasons are given. First, that you may know how we are. The, we, in this verse may also refer to the others serving with Paul in Rome during this time. These included Aristarchus, Mark, Jesus called Justice, Epaphras, Luke, and Demas, Colossians 4 verses 10-14. Second, Paul sent Tychicus to, encourage your hearts. Tychicus was likely gifted as an encourager. Paul wanted him to build up the Ephesian believers with encouraging stories and teachings in addition to those shared in Paul's written letter. Tychicus is also noted as a person who would encourage the hearts of the Colossian believers, Colossians 4 verse 8. Though not the top leader, Tychicus served as an important figure and had tremendous influence in the early church, traveling to several locations both with Paul and apart from him to share the gospel and encourage early believers. Verse 23. Peace be to the brothers, and love with faith, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul offers his concluding words over verses 23 and 24, including another mention of peace. This verse uses the Greek word adelphois, which literally means, brothers, and generally refers to males. In context, however, it seems to mean both men and women, as, brothers and sisters, in Christ. Earlier in Ephesians, Paul made reference to Christians in terms encompassing all people, regardless of gender, Ephesians 4 verse 8. Paul's wish for peace extends to all believers in Ephesus. In addition to peace, Paul offered, love with faith. These traits are acknowledged as, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul opened the letter with a dual emphasis on Father and Christ and concludes with them together. In Paul's mind, he understood the Father and Son are one God. 
Interestingly, a special symmetry is provided in this verse. Peace is to the men and women of the Church, with faith and love, from God the Father and Jesus Christ, brothers-slash-sisters, love-slash-faith, father-slash-son. Some of Paul's other letters end with similar statements, 2 Corinthians 13 verses 11-14. Verse 24. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. As with many of his letters, Paul ends with the grace of God and the words, Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. This, love incorruptible, is love that is pure and perfect. In a corrupt society, God's love could not be corrupted. Grace is a driving theme in Paul's ministry and in this letter in particular. He begins with grace, Ephesians 1 verse 2, teaches on grace, Ephesians 1 verses 6 and 7, notes salvation as being by God's grace, Ephesians 2 verses 5 and 7, 8, 3 colon 2, calls himself a minister of God's grace, Ephesians 3 verses 7 and 8, teaches grace is given as a gift, Ephesians 4 verse 7, words are to give grace to others, Ephesians 4 verse 29, and ends here with giving grace to all believers. Paul had personally experienced God's grace to receive salvation, Acts 9, and committed the rest of his life to communicating this wonderful plan of salvation, Romans 1 verse 16, to others. Book Summary Ephesians follows a theme common in Paul's writings, connecting theory with practice. In this book, however, he goes into greater depth before making the transition. As a letter meant to be read by more than just the believers at Ephesus, this is an important look at how Christian belief should translate into Christian action. The first three chapters lay out spiritual ideas, the last three chapters show how these truths should be applied in the life of a mature believer. Paul focuses heavily on love, the unity of the Christian Church, and the incredible value of our salvation through Christ. End of chapter 6 and the book of Ephesians Please note the material use in this post, video is from biblaref.com which is from God Questions Ministries and is posted here to be read by Immersive Reader in the Edge browser. If you copy this material please follow these rules. Content from biblaref.com may not be used for any commercial purposes, or as part of any commercial work, without explicit prior written consent from God Questions Ministries. Any use of our material should be properly credited, please make it clear the content is from biblaref.com. Bibleref.com content may not be altered, modified, or otherwise changed unless such changes are specifically noted.